Okay, hopefully it's not a surprise that today we're going to talk about photosynthesis. There's no quiz. Um, there's no questions for this one yet. So um, hopefully you just previewed it at least a little bit to remind yourself about everything you knew about it from freshman year. And I will hopefully update some of that information for you in your mind. And also try to incorporate some of the themes that we've discussed so far. So it's not about memorizing uh, chemical reaction uh, names in, in AP Bio. It's not about memorizing enzyme names or uh, reaction intermediates. It's really about understanding the themes because they're going to give you all that information on the test and they're trying to test you on do you understand this theme or can you incorporate um, you know, a certain idea into a process like photosynthesis. So I'll be explicit um, when I when I mention all those things. So for us to start this conversation, I'm going to remind you what redox reactions are. Does anybody remember what that stands for? Some of you had chemistry last year. You might be taking AP chemistry again this year. What is the re the red in the redox reaction mean? Good. So the gaining of electron results in the reduction of that atom, right? The ox part is oxidation. So for uh, an atom that is oxidized, it loses those electrons, right? So generically, we can show that transfer of electron here going from the X to the Y. So it's here in the reactant, uh, reactants of this reaction. You're losing an electron here, so you're oxidized. Here's your final state as a product. And here, Y is becoming reduced, showing the addition of the ele electron there. So we don't really get into it in a more complicated fashion than that. We just mentioned the passing along of electron uh, as a redox reaction. So here looking at um, you know, the joining together of these uh, atoms of these elements, right, in the formation of salt, essentially the, the, um, the way that that plays out, one is uh, gaining one and one is losing one in the formation of salt. So you should be able to identify based on the, um, the symbols there showing the ions, which was which, so which one was reduced. right? Because it's overall like the reduction. I want you to think of like if you're having electrons added to you, your overall charge is reduced. It's lowered. Uh, whereas here, this one is losing them. So it's overall is positive, which gets a little tricky because that's which is reduced and which is oxidized. But which is the reducer and which is the oxidizer? It's sort of flipped, right? So if you're um, sodium, in this example, what are you? The reducer, right? Even though it's being oxidized, it's the reducer. So it's transferring those electrons. Good. It's, it's really not going to be any more complicated than that. I mean, we can show um, in the combustion of hydrocarbons like methane, you could show how energy is um, released in those chemical reactions. So Oxygen, uh, in the presence of oxygen, everything can combust rather well just because um, of its tendency to share electrons unequally. So the, the sharing of electrons unequally uh, basically results in energy loss um, as the electrons go from uh, being shared equally to unequally. So you can see that here as the electrons shift towards the oxygens and the carbon dioxide and uh, similarly with the um, oxygen and water. And as a result of that, that unequal sharing, now you have energy being released to do something. So, you know, this is the combustion of methane, but you, you could easily put in uh, a hydrocarbon rich organic molecule like carbohydrates into that reaction and see the same thing, right? Aerobic cellular respiration um, is the same thing, right? You're combusting, um, those molecules in the presence of oxygen. But that's just a, a, a preview for down the road. The take home for this is um, for photosynthesis and cell respiration, 
it's essentially a long chain of redox reactions where one molecule is giving up its electrons, it's being oxidized, and it's passing those electrons to another molecule, which is being reduced. And then the same thing happens, it's oxidized and it reduces something else. You guys remember electron transport chains? That terminology should sound familiar. What do these transport chains transport? Electrons. Yeah, so um, it's funny. A lot of the names of these things, it's pretty logical, pretty straightforward, right? But here's one of those themes that I was mentioning before. In our last unit, we talked about um, the difference between high potential energy and lower potential energy. Um, unstable versus stable, reactive versus unreactive. So at the beginning of an electron transport chain, all the electrons that are um, fed into that, those chains, right? So the lead protein as it's um, reduced, describe the energy state of those electrons at the beginning. And we're symbolically drawing this as a, as a staircase for a reason. Right, Jen? Good, perfect, right? So they're at that high energy state at the top of the stairs. And as it slowly goes down, it's like a ball that's at a different position on the staircase as it goes down. It's losing potential energy. And that kinetic energy is being used for something. And eventually you reach a low energy state where there's no energy involved there unless you recharge it somehow, okay? So um, this is a theme. We use electrons like this in both cellular respiration and photosynthesis. And um, we do that in lieu of using ATP because we're trying to make ATP in both of those processes, right? You can see the symbol here in the ETC and photosynthesis and in cell respiration, we're trying to make ATP. Which process makes more ATP? Photosynthesis or cell respiration? <laughs> yeah, you had a 50 50 shot. You took it. I admire you. Um, cell respiration, like its job is just to crank out ATP. Okay, so it's got. Um, glucose and other molecules being fed into it, and it just constantly makes ATP, which we will get to. We haven't even talked about it yet. I was just sort of asking you guys. You, you also have to recall um, hemiosmosis. Does anybody remember what that means? It says osmosis, so. Good. It establishes electrochemical gradients for sure. It's sort of um, unfairly named osmosis because that's usually the diffusion of what? Water. Water. So that's kind of tri uh, tricky. But it's um, moving H pluses, hydrogen ions, protons to different parts um, of the organelle half of the time through active transport, the other half through passive transport to utilize those energy systems to make ATP, okay? So we'll come back to that, but there's another overlapping theme. You have to remember active transport. You have to remember passive transport. You also have to remember surface area to volume ratios to really understand this. So I'll, I'll bring that up again shortly. Here is how I approach photosynthesis. Um, I'm trying to build on knowledge that you already have, maybe from freshman year or just in general. Um, in the end, my goal is to relate it to cell respiration so that you understand that in many ways, these two energy systems are reciprocal, right? As far as reactants and products and what are the energetic themes in them. And then we're gonna look at this from a who, what, where, why, and how perspective, okay? so. What organisms, the who's, who's are doing photos, who is doing photosyn photosynthesis? Um, what is photosynthesis? Where is it happening? Why does it happen and how? Okay. So first we'll watch this video. Plants. Okay. 
So back to our, our discussion here. Uh, what types of organisms, if you, if you can give me the broadest category of organism, what are the kinds of organisms that perform photosynthesis? Okay, sure, yeah. Good, but this is a little more uh, inclusive. It's a little broader, right? Plants is one category, as are flowers, as are trees. Those are like the, the ones we think of the most. Can anybody think of another sort of weird example, George? Algae, good, algae is a good one. Algae comes in all uh, different types of forms, by the way, right? Kelp, what we think of as seaweed is actually um, uh, algae, right? So this is not technically a plant, it's, it's an algae. As are these things called diatoms. They're small single cellular um, organisms that have silica as their cell wall, yeah. Um, so it's a different, it's a different um, part, part of life. Yeah. So um, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about this bottom row. That's why I bring it up because it, because I think of flowers, plants, and trees as autotrophs, but um, large multicellular algae, it's a, um, it's a long chain of these photosynthetic uh, organisms. Same thing with these, except they're not, they're not fused together. They're individual. This is a bacterium and this is a, um, a protist, euglena. So I don't know anything about their biology. I just find them to be interesting examples. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a separate um, extension of the tree of life. This is a, a bacterium called, um, what do they call them? Cyanobacteria, right? So which is very interesting because bacteria are prokaryotes, right? So how could a prokaryotic cell be photosynthetic if they don't have chloroplasts inside? I'll just leave that in the air, right? So like the, we tend to think of um, photosynthetic organisms as organisms that have chloroplasts. And for the most part, everything else up there does, but you can also do it without um, a chloroplast um, by having some of the proteins embedded in your cell membrane. So that's sort of an interesting um, aside. And, and this is a, um, a plant-like protist. It, it's, you know, there's a poster right here in front of the, the counter here, and it shows animal-like and plant-like protists. So um, amoeba, paramecia are examples of the animal-like ones where they can surround their their prey with um, the cell membrane but um, they've also adapted chloroplasts inside to make their own food instead of hunting after things and I know nothing beyond that um, okay so so keep in mind um, these organisms are making their own food because for many of them they're rooted into the ground Right? They've evolved a, um, a strategy where they just stay in one place and draw up water and nutrients and use the sun to make sugar. For other things like, um, like that euglena, they don't have mouths, so they're not going out and trying to find things uh, to eat. And basically they take in this solar energy, convert it into carbohydrates, so the primary carbohydrate that they make is glucose, right? So it's a G3P and then you, you fuse together two G3Ps to make a glucose. From there, you can make sucrose. From there, you can make polysaccharides. Um, and in the process, they're also generating heat because the process of making these carbohydrates and photosynthesis is inefficient. So what does this process look like? Well, you have certain reactants coming in to photosynthesis. So those reactants are up here and you have some key products coming out, but you can be even more specific, right? There are two parts to photosynthesis, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. So the light reactions take place in these structures here. What are these things called? Thylakoids. Thylakoids, good. Yeah, so that's um, just a, a membrane uh, creating a space for these reactions to happen. So um, 
This itself is a double membrane structure of the chloroplast. These structures are within the chloroplast, okay? So what would be this fluid out here surrounding the chloroplast? Ah, so the stroma would be inside of the chloroplast, right? Like, so everywhere that there's not stacks of thylakoids, it's stroma, what would it be? <laughs> you're, you're thinking of the pores on the underside of the leaf. Yeah, this is just cytoplasm, right? So this is just an organelle inside of a plant cell, right? So I, I want to make that distinction because often when we look at this, some students will think, okay, here's the cell. Here's the cell membrane. Here's the cytoplasm. But this is a structure inside of the organelle that's inside the cytoplasm, okay? Um, so this out here, this gray area in this picture would be stroma. Yeah. Say it again. Cytoplasm. Yeah. So according to this diagram, what are the reactants for the light reactions? Water is one. Light is one. And that's it, right? So these things feed in. Um, what about these arrows for these things going in? I, you say it again? Uh, no, we'll come back to them. They're not. So light reactions produce a couple of key products. What's the, the most obvious product? So then they need the NADP and Good. Yeah. So usually people say oxygen is the most obvious, but you're 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 getting ahead, which is good. The the, the light reactions make high energy ATP and high energy NADPH. So the diagram also shows us then that what part of photosynthesis requires those high energy molecules? Yeah, the Calvin cycle, right? They're feeding into the Calvin cycle along with CO2 to make what key molecule? Sugars, right? So technically G3P, which was then made into glucose. Yeah, so the light reaction charges these things to make them high energy. The Calvin cycle uses them and spits out low energy products that need to be recharged again in the light reactions. Yep, sure. Okay, so CO2 is coming in from the atmosphere to help these reactions take place in the Calvin cycle. Here's another perspective. I like this one because it shows you these two membranes here. What are those two membranes? What essential idea theory, if you will, will support are supported by that picture? You have an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and then you have these thylakoids inside. What do these two membranes right here mean? An endosymbiosis. Yeah, endosymbiosis, the endosymbiont theory, right? So um, this inner membrane is the ancient prokaryotes original membrane, and the outer membrane is from when they were engulfed into that other prokaryotic cell to be used for energy production, okay? So that, that picture right there to me really shows that endosymbiont theory in action. In addition, the chloroplasts have their own genetic material. Okay, where? So where is this happening? Well, what is the primary, if you're looking at a, a tree, for example, what's the primary uh, part of that tree that will perform photosynthesis? The leaves, the picture really helps you there, right? Like the picture is showing you the leaves. So like, why not the roots? There's still what? Oh, because the roots are buried, right? Yeah. Okay. Why not the stem? It is. Oh, good. So if you're a plant or a tree and you're sitting there like this with your leaves out, they're essentially solar panels, right? So their high surface area and low volume, because they're very thin, helps that sunlight get in there to get those reactions going. 
So the leaves are the primary photosynthetic part of the plant or tree or what have you. If you take a cross section of that leaf on the top, you'll see the cuticle. It's often waxy to prevent uh, water loss. Same thing on the bottom, you have that cuticle with the stomata that we were just talking about. Um, stroma without an R. Um, but um, yeah, these pores are for gases entering. What key gas would have to enter in for photosynthesis through the stomata? Carbon dioxide and what gas comes out? Oxygen, good. Now this is the mesophyll layer. You know it's photosynthetic because they've the artist has taken what approach? Why not this layer or this layer? Why does this one really scream photosynthesis? Because it's green, yeah. Inside the mesophyll layer are mesophyll cells. Mesophyll cells are also very green. Why are they green? Because they're loaded with what? Pigments. They're, yep, so they're loaded with uh, chloroplasts, which themselves are loaded with chlorophyll. Yeah, the, the photosynthetic pigment, the predominant photosynthetic pigment that is in the thylakoid membrane. So this is like the Google Earth approach. If you're looking down at a leaf, that's earth and you can zoom into like, if I zoomed in even one more layer into the thylakoid membrane, right? That'd be like 315 Academy Avenue. Here's another view. I like this view because it shows you that the thylakoids are not round, but instead flattened and they're stacked on top of each other. What, what adaptation why is that an adaptation? Why does that help um, photosynthetic organisms to have them flattened out and stacked? You're increasing the surface area and keeping the volume lower for those thylakoids. So you're getting lots of membrane to perform photosynthesis. Okay. Okay, getting back to the green uh, idea. Why, why do artists draw things green when they're photosynthetic? Yeah, so when, of all the, the energy that we're exposed to on earth, we're dealing with like that one little sl uh, sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? Visible light. And of visible light, the only wavelength um, that is not used is green. So everything else, can be absorbed by chlorophyll, but green. So green is reflected off of that pigment. Why do we see it as green? Yeah. Because it's the only visible light wavelength that it doesn't absorb. It reflects. it reflects, and that's what our eye sees, right? Yeah, and your brain senses greenness. So I want to just introduce quickly this idea of ground versus excited. Um, I don't know if you guys talk about this in chemistry or physics, but um, the electrons in an atom, when they're pulled away from the nucleus of an atom, um, does the potential energy of the electron increase or decrease? So if I hit an atom with light and the electron pulls out, yeah, it increases, much like a slingshot. When you pull the, um, the slingshot back, you're increasing potential energy. Well, it's the same thing if you energize electrons. They go from this ground to this excited state, and you can actually visualize the transition from uh, excited back down to ground by hitting a, um, a solution of pigment molecules with, uh, with light of a certain wavelength, it'll fluoresce. So that's basically what the fluorescence is. And this is probably some, some sort of homogenate of, um, a, chlor, uh, of a uh, photosynthetic organism like chlorella. Okay. So why do organisms perform photosynthesis? Seems like a silly question, but. 
Yeah, so they're getting raw materials to convert into a usable form of energy, right? So for a lot of organisms, um, this is their food, their quote food, right? So why do we, why do they need food? <laughs> to survive, what else? Yeah, so they need to convert it into ATP to support all those other processes, right? So um, ener energy used for endergonic reactions, right? So ultimately the sugars will be converted into ATP. ATP hydrolysis can be used to um, counteract the energy needed to do endergonic reactions, like those that fight entropy. What's an example of a reaction that will fight entropy? This is like a couple of your test questions. Any reaction? Will any reaction fight entropy? No, I mean like dehydration. Good. Dehydration synthesis is a good one. Like, why is that? Because it's what? It's actually, it's actually doing the opposite, right? It's storing energy. It's making it more ordered. More ordered. Good. Okay. I'm just trying to overlap some of those ideas. Um, good. Okay, so like I said before, we're only using this little sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, to perform photosynthesis. You can't use any of the shorter wavelengths or any of the longer wavelengths. Um, so if you go outside right now, you're gonna catch the last uh, bit of the fall foliage, right? The leaves are starting to uh, fall. But um, over the past four weeks beforehand, what was the process like? What did you What did you see from like late summer to to now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I would I would say that those pigments have always been there, but the predominant pigment chlorophyll, which remind me of it reflects what wavelength? green, we saw those as green and we see those as green throughout the spring and summer. because It's very abundant, but it's also temperature sensitive. So as soon as the weather starts to cool off, that pigment breaks down and it's not produced anymore. So what does that reveal in the foliage that you see now with the yellows and reds and orange? What do you think those colors signify? The yeah, it's, it's the secondary pigments, right? So many of those secondary pigments fall into the category of carotenoids, um, which is just another um, light absorbing pigment. Um, but in this case, you know, for carotenoids, um, in this case, it reflects uh, yellow and absorbs better in the green spectrum. Why is that an, an adaptation that increases fitness for autotrophs? So in other words, why does it like help some uh, organisms survive to have this secondary pigment system? So that like, if, if like they can't absorb one type of pigment for some reason, like if it's not available, then they can still like make food for themselves with like another type? Absolutely, yeah, it's a backup mechanism for light absorption and, and photosynthesis, right? So, um, it wouldn't make sense to have like multiple backup pigments that also only reflect green and absorb the rest of the, the spectrum. Um, instead, these ones are absorbing green and reflecting other colors. And we're seeing the other colors now that, that chlorophyll is removed. So I think that's an interesting idea. Okay, so where is this happening? So if you had to pick a membrane that photosynthesis was occurring in, what would you say? Thylakoid membrane. Thylakoid membrane. Yeah, remember, if, if you panic, just look up at the board. Thylakoid membrane is shown here. So this is that membrane of those small flattened discs. And throughout that membrane, you'll find photosystems. So they're membrane proteins but what's special about them is they also have um, bound to them uh, are these uh, light absorbing pigment molecules. 
the chlorophyll shown here in green. So when light enters into the, the leaf and ultimately into the chloroplast and at the thylakoid membrane, it will excite the electrons in the pigment. They'll go from ground to excited. And that has a rippling effect where it's like the wave at a stadium, right? Once these guys get excited, the, the rippling uh, passes through the photosystem, ultimately to the reaction center of the, of the protein, okay? So here it's just ground to excited ground to excited. There's no electron transfer, but here we get to our first redox. Okay, so this chlorophyll, and you're going to see, you know, terms like P680 and P700 to identify these. You don't have to memorize those, but this is special in that it's going to send its electrons to this um, primary electron acceptor. Okay. If these pigments here are passing their electrons up here, what do they now lack? Electrons. So why is that a problem if you're trying to form an electron transport chain? Because it stops, right? Yeah. Um, so where do we get our electrons to replace those electrons from? The splitting of water. Splitting of water, good. So in a process that we won't go into, light can actually uh, lice or split water molecules into its component atoms. Um, but suffice it to say for us, if you separate water into its atoms, you get two hydrogens and one oxygen, right? So why then is this cartoon showing us you get two H pluses, two hydrogen ions, and one half O2? What is one half O2? O Oxygen, <laughs> right? So I don't know, I, th I think it's funny that they write it like that, but it's true, right? Um, molecular oxygen, the uh, diatomic oxygen, right? It's just two oxygen atoms fused together. Um, so for every water that's split, you're contributing one half of the oxygen that will diffuse away, okay? Well, what about the H pluses? I thought hydrogen, ion, hydrogen atoms also had electrons. Why aren't they neutral? What did we say we had to replace once there's an electron transfer here? Electrons, <laughs> right? So if you take an electron away from a hydrogen, what are you left with? A proton, right? A hydrogen ion, an H plus. Yeah. So that's why they're saying that because we split water, take the two electrons from hydrogen to keep this pathway cranking along. In the process, we create oxygen and these H pluses, which we'll use to create concentration gradients in a moment. Does that make sense? So why do your plants die when you don't water them? Yeah, because you start starving them at photosystem two, right? If all of this is leading to the production of sugar in the Calvin cycle, and all of that is dependent on the flow of electrons, if you don't provide water to replace those, you've started the starvation process right off the bat in one of the first reactions. Okay, so light is constantly coming in, light is constantly exciting these, and this transfer is constantly happening. So this photosystem, which is the first in the pathway, is named what? Photosystem two, right? Logically, it's photosystem two. Is that logical? Yeah. What would a better name be? Photosystem one? Photosystem one? Yeah. <laughs> photosystem one is the second photosystem in the pathway. So what's up with that? Well, so the problem is that photosystem one, the second photosystem in the pathway was discovered first oh, yeah. and named photosystem one. And then the, photo, the first photosystem, photosystem two was discovered second and nobody ever bothered to change the naming or somebody protested because when you think about it, people discovered these. And if you discovered something and you gave it its name, 
how uh, likely are you to want to relinquish your, your naming discovery? Right, we see this all the time in science and medicine. If you discover like a, um, a new disease, you're like, yeah, I'm going to name this Kinzer disease, right? I mean, people do that, right? Like think about all the stuff in medicine and, and uh, science and it's, it's named after people, which they're trying to do away with because the name should describe some of the function, right? Like what's going on instead of like, like what's a Golgi body? It's an organelle discovered by a guy named Golgi, oh. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, you know what it does. It modifies proteins produced inside the endos endomembrane system, but it's it's named after a, an Italian scientist that discovered it, right? So we have to deal with the fact that these are named out of order. So to be um, hopefully a little more logical, I will say the following. Photosystem two, the first photosystem in the pathway, starts off the transfer of electrons and ultimately will reduce this first protein in the electron transport chain. So you don't have to know the names of these complexes. We're just gonna call it the ETC. So once the ETC receives the electrons, once it's reduced, um, they're drawing this in a downward trajectory. Why are they drawing that downward? What does it symbolize? That, that makes sense. Um, it's, it's not the reason. So they're describing the energetic state of the electrons as they're passed from protein to protein. So what happens to their energy? It decreases, right? Because we're using that energy to make ATP. So that's the second red circle, just showing the decrease in electron energy as ATP is produced. Well then describe the energy state of the electrons once they get to this pair of chlorophyll molecules in photosystem one, the second photosystem in the pathway. Are they high energy, low energy, medium? They're low energy. Well, that's not good, right? That's not good because we don't want to pass along low energy electrons. So what should you do? How can you excite it? Yeah. So photosystem one, the second photosystem in the pathway is essentially going to recharge those electrons using light energy before it again sends them off to the electron acceptor. Um, there is another small ETC here, but I don't really talk about it that much. I only talk about this one because it makes ATP. So this one accepts the electrons. They're now high energy. Ultimately, it's going to reduce NADP plus, making it NADPH, okay? Um, so this is a high energy molecule now that we've made by reducing and adding a couple of uh, protons to this molecule. You know how I remember this one? Because there's also NADH in cell respiration. You know how you remember this one, um, NADPH? P for photosynthesis, obviously. Okay. Any questions on this stuff? Tell me a couple of themes from previous units that are shown in this picture. What's an overlapping idea? Okay, how so? Okay. Good. Yeah, I like it. I buy it. O overall photosynthesis, would you say it's ender or exergonic? Ender. Definitely ender, right? Because you're taking water and carbon dioxide and you're making this very powerful glucose molecule in the end, right? 
which in and of itself, a simple monosaccharide, not very impressive, when, except that you, when you um, put it through cell respiration, it, it yields a fair amount of ATP, right? So very endergonic overall. Good. What energy do we use to make that happen? Since you have to add energy into that endergonic reaction. Light, light is helping it along. Yeah, for sure. And you're also producing some ATP and some uh, NADH, NADPH. Okay. Here's another way of showing what we just said. So light gets photosynthesis started by taking these electrons from their ground to their excited state. So from low energy to high energy. That high energy electron can have some of its energy used. So it's showing it going from high to low to move this thing, right? It's almost like a turbine or a mill to make ATP. Problem is, is that now they're lower energy. So we hit them again with a photon of light, some energy to boost them back into a high excited state, energetic state, and they can be placed into an electron carrier and sent where? the Calvin cycle, good, which takes place in the stroma. Uh, I have a question. Sure. So in the beginning, you asked what the ADP bonds were and the ADP bonds. Yep. Um, are they, is that like a complement reaction that goes back to the ADP again? Yeah, so that's exactly it, um, except the coupling actually occurs in the Calvin cycle, which we'll see in a moment, but them coming back as low energy molecules, it's like, I mean, ADP is one of the ones coming back, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a situation where these low energy molecules can, can once again be re-energized and used for purposes, right? So um, thinking back to the last unit, when we saw the, the person that had dived off the uh, platform, you know, what could they do to get back into that high potential energy state? Say it again, climb the stairs, which takes a little bit of energy, but puts them in an overall higher energy state, right? That can be utilized again. So they're gonna come back to the light reactions and we're gonna use light energy to stimulate them again to make NADPH and ATP, which is a high energy molecule that can be used in the Calvin cycle, okay? Here's another, I think more confusing, <laughs> picture of what we just talked about, but um, you never know. Really pressing upon you the, the energy of the sun and the reactions. All right, let's talk about the details of ATP production in the light reactions. Okay, we said that the energy source that's used to stimulate ATP, ATP production is what? No. What is the energy source for that process? It's not ATP because we're trying to make ATP, right? Is it light? I think so. Okay. Say it again. Water. Anybody else? Hang on, I lost where I am. There it is. Okay, so what energy source creates this here? Well, we see that the photosystems are really the place where light comes into play, right? So while light does stimulate the electrons and re-energize them here, it's not playing a role in the ETC. Now water is ultimately the source of electrons here, but once it's broken down into hydrogen and oxygen, it's really not playing a role at all. But the things that water gave up are. So what are the things that water gave up to photosynthesis? Electrons, electrons right? So electrons that are being passed along here, uh, their energy is going to be used for ATP production. Now, according to this picture, what is the thing that must be done to create a concentration gradient? So I'm saying that electron energy will be used to 
perform this energy requiring process shown up here. So what are electrons used for based on this picture? It's an energy requiring process. Isn't it active transport? Active transport, yeah. So it's gonna actively transport H pluses, right? As the electrons flow through here, it'll use that energy to bring these from here. Can we all agree that it's low concentration out here? To a high concentration here. Right, that's against the concentration gradient going from low to high. So to do that, it needs energy. It uses the electron energy to do that. So where now is the concentration of H plus is highest? Inside the thylakoid, right? So why would you rather concentrate H pluses in this space here versus out here. So if I challenged you to, to find a space where you could concentrate the most golf balls, would you pick this room here or would you pick maybe the closet? Why? Because the area is smaller, right? So I'm gonna change the, the area to volume, right? The volume of the room is smaller because I wanna emphasize surface area, right? So the surface area of these thylakoids is very high because there's lots of that membrane in which you can put photosystems, ETC, and this protein here, which we'll talk about in a minute. So the more space you have to put these proteins, the more photosynthesis, more light reactions you'll get. Now, if the volume of this space is larger, what is it harder to do? Like with the analogy with the golf balls. It's harder to, con to get a high concentration, right? In this space, a thousand golf balls might not even fill the floor, right? But in the closet, it's gonna you know, give you probably a, a good foot or two of golf balls, right? So you get higher concentrations faster in smaller volumes, which is why we concentrate them in here. Okay, now once they're at high concentration, they can diffuse passively. So again, taking a look at the diagram, where do they go from and to and through and what protein do they use to go to that area? Yeah, so they go from inside back to outside through ATP synthase. Okay. So ATP synthase, you saw in the video, it starts to rotate and move as H pluses flow through it. So it's um, like a small motor turning. So that energy can be used to couple um, an ADP with a phosphate to make ATP. Okay, that's the process of chemiosmosis going from uh, low to high, high to low. Yeah. Be Say it again. Why does it do that? Because you need that high concentration for them to pass through ATP synthase. Yeah, so it's the passing of H pluses freely through that protein that makes the ATP. If you didn't have this concentration, you wouldn't have this protein moving and you wouldn't have ATP produced. Yeah. And so you see, again, you get to a low concentration out here because the, the space in the stroma is um, higher volume, right? So even though they were concentrated in the thylakoid, now they're diffuse out there and we actively transport them in so long as we have the electron energy to do so. If you don't water your plants, you're not gonna get that. Any questions on that part? Wait, are these just the same H pluses? Like that, like do they just keep going through the cycle? Yeah, they do, but they're also constantly being created by um, photolysis. So that breaking down of water. Remember when we took the electrons? It leaves behind an H plus. And by the way, these H pluses can go wherever they want. They don't have to stay 
inside the chloroplast so they can leave the chloroplast and go into the cytoplasm. But as long as, as, long as water is still being um, broken down, we'll have H pluses. Part two. So this is Dr. Melvin Calvin. He won the Nobel Prize for his uh, work on the Calvin cycle. And um, basically what he found was that outside in the stroma, there is a series of enzymes concentrated um, to facilitate the following reactions. So um, you don't have to memorize the intermediates. I just figure it doesn't have the enzymes that facilitate these reactions. We're thinking big picture here, okay? Um, but this reminds me, right? So the reason that eukaryotic cells have compartmentalized um, organelles is so they can create subspecialization, right? Um, in other words, lysosomes have enzymes that break things down. Golgi have enzymes that facilitate, um, you know, adding sugars to proteins or um, creating disulfide bridges. Likewise, the the uh, stroma of the chloroplast has the enzymes that facilitate this, whereas inside the thylakoids, you won't find these enzymes, right? They're localized to a certain location. Okay, um, you can see here that the really important reactant for the Calvin cycle is what? What is feeding in? Carbon dioxide, yeah. So carbon dioxide feeds into the Calvin cycle. Ultimately, you're producing what? sugars and you're bringing those low energy molecules back to the thylakoids. Good. Uh, real quick, before we get into the, the details, and we'll probably stop with the details because I this is where we stopped in the other classes, but um, what is the role of ATP that we produced in the light reactions here? So maybe those in the front row, you can see those letters. Um, what is ATP doing here? This is called 3PG. And this is called BPG. Okay, um, so it actually it actually doesn't break it down, but we'll, we'll keep it we'll keep it simple. It's simply facilitating the conversion of this molecule into this one. Okay, so it's rearranging bonds, um, but you need the energy from this reaction to do that. Okay, uh, what is left over once that energy is used here. ADP and phosphate. So here's a here's a cautionary tale, right? When I sometimes when I ask freshmen like what is the purpose of ATP? Do you guys remember, you know, freshman year, like what would be an answer that a freshman might say? I don't mean to I'm not I'm not freshman shaming, but to give energy, which, you know, we're kind of saying that, yeah, that's fine, but um, but here's, here's a very a not good answer. The purpose of ATP is to create ADP, right? Because you're showing ATP going to ADP, but symbolically, you're just sort of saying like, well, the energy that's stored in this like giant starburst, right? Like we're using it to facilitate the reaction of 3PG to BPG. Right, that's fair to say. Um, please don't say um, ATP makes ADP. Right? I mean, I don't, I don't expect you guys to say that, but and what I, you know, what I tell them is like, well, if when you order a pizza, you're hungry, you need some energy. Like you order a pizza, and if you're if you're telling me that the purpose of ATP is to make ADP, that's like telling me you ordered that pizza for the box. Right, like the pizza's here, finally my box is here. And you like just, um, so obviously the energy that's stored in this molecule is used to facilitate this reaction from here to here. Now let's talk about the, from an energy, energy perspective, describe the state of this molecule um, regarding like the reaction. Does it, does it want to become BPG? Is it reactive enough? Is it unstable enough? This molecule here, 3PG? Or does it need a nudge? 
Yeah. So that's the thing is like you're hydrolyzing ATP in this reaction. You're coupling an exergonic reaction to an endergonic reaction. So this reaction wouldn't happen without the assistance of ATP. So that's an example of an endergonic reaction that needs a nudge. Okay. This wouldn't, you wouldn't get to this without the help of this. Same thing with BPG to G3P. In this case, you're using electron energy again to stimulate the formation of G3P, which is ultimately your final product of the Calvin cycle. But the video that we just watched said, well, actually most of the, the, um, most of the G3P sugar is put back into the process. So what does that mean? So it's showing here G3P coming out. I don't know how to get rid of this little bar, but I think if I just leave it alone, there it is. So G3P comes out and it's um, used to make glucose and other organic molecules. But we're also showing the arrow going back in called the regeneration of RUBP. So what's going on with that? Good. Yeah. So to ensure, right, this is the Calvin cycle. To ensure that it's cyclical and constantly occurring, you need the raw materials to start another round of the cycle. So most of the G3P sugar that you that you create is recycled back in to regenerate RUBP, which is joined together with car uh, carbon dioxide to make this unstable product. Okay. All right, so that's as far as I want to get. We're going to watch a quick video. 